afternoon, good morning everyone. Thank you all for joining again for a, uh, another webinar. Today we'll be uh, focusing mostly on Officio and we'll better to talk, let, uh, let them talk about Officio than Officio themselves. So today we have a guest speaker, which is, uh, which is our colleague from Belgium, Jan. Uh, Jan van Houwerem, Houwermeijen. Uh, and uh, I will give the word to him so he can uh, tell you all about Ovisio. The floor is yours, Jan. Hello, uh, good afternoon, everybody. So uh, I'm um, Jan van Hovermeer, VP uh, Sales and Marketing with Ovisio. Um, thank you very much for joining. So today I will talk about uh, a very specific application that we developed um, together with some universities and customers of us, um, where we show the ability of our 3D holographic technology to monitor uh, viral infection kinetics within um, a culture. Um, Jan, if I can interrupt you for one second, um, I see that you have it in that we see presenter mode for you. Okay. I don't know if you can hit on the top uh, schermen omwisselen, so it might look a little bit better for us. Yes, perfect. Thank you so much. So what exactly is um, 3D holographic imaging? Oh, sorry. So what, what exactly is 3D holographic imaging? Um, a 3D holographic image basically is what you see in the circle on the bottom in the middle. Um, and the information we get from that um, from that very specific image, that is what we use to analyze and to identify cells, to analyze cells, to count them, to look at viability, um, among other things. So the principle, the technology behind it, this is what you can see here. It's quite similar to phase contrast um, imaging with some added features and some added uh, software behind and the results on, of this very specific um, setup I would say that we can use to monitor everything uh, and to do that in line. So the images that we actually produce is what you can see here. For every image that we produce we basically produce three images. The first one is the regular intensity or bright field image a bright field image, because we are not using any dyes or reagents, um, they don't show a lot. So you, you see basic non, non dyed cells. Then, of course, we have the face image. The face image can already tell us a little bit more on the cells and on the status of the cells and, and the size and the shape of the cells. But then, of course, we have the 3D holographic image, and that's really where all the, the parameters are behind and that's really what we use as well in the analysis of uh, the combination of all those three images that's that's what we use in, in all our analysis but a very important part because we are actually uh, taking images of a 3d volume and not of a 2d flat surface we are able to refocus all the cells um, that are in the field of view so that's what you see in the small video playing on the um, down corner, down right corner. So all cells that we image, we are quite sure that the analysis will be done properly because all cells will be in focus um, on, on the image. So the analysis will be done properly. So how do we do the analysis? It's a five step process and it starts of course with the acquisition of the hologram. Um, after the acquisition of the hologram, we have a computation phase. The computation phase is important to be able to detect the light cones. And the light cones, those are very important not only to detect where the different objects or where the different cells are, but as well, it's very important to look at the viability of the cells. Once that's done, there is the refocusing of all the objects. And then we extract what we call the fingerprint of a cell and the fingerprint of the cell that's used in a machine learning uh, algorithm that um, gives a result. The five steps, it, it basically takes a couple of milliseconds to, um, to perform them. So I, on the previous slide, I told you a little bit on the fingerprint. 
So the holographic fingerprint for cells basically is a combination of 70 parameters, uh, which are recorded on a single cell level um, with four subcategories. So there is the morphological parameters that you all know the best. So the nucleus to cytoplasm ratio, the volume, the size, the circularity, uh, the cell perimeter, the diameter of the cells. So all those parameters are taken into account for the analysis. But then we take as well into account a lot of optical parameters and phase texture and intensity texture uh, parameters. So all, all those parameters are um, fed into a machine learning platform and that machine learning platform comes up with new algorithms that can be used in real time during the monitoring of a, of a bioprocess. So machine learning, what, what exactly is machine learning? Machine learning basically helps us creating the algorithms. Um, we are not the um, writers of the algorithm, so that's done by, by a machine learning platform. And how does that happens is actually quite easy to explain. So it all starts with the creation of a learning set uh, where we define, can be together with customers or, or we do that ourselves, where we define two populations within a big group. So uh, for example, the population of dead cells and a population of viral cells or the population of infected cells and population of non-infected cells it can also be um, cell type A and cell type B. And then the machine learning platform goes looking to the images that are in population A and population B and goes looking for trends within the 70 par parameters that are recorded on a single cell level and starts looking into the differences between the two populations. In the first step it comes up with an algorithm and in the next step, uh, step two, we provide system training. So that basically means that we provide to the um, machine learning platform and to the algorithm that we provide images where there is a mixture of, of the population. So um, ideally it's a, it's a predefined and a well-known mixture where there is 10% dead cells or where there is 20% dead cells, 30% or 10% infected cells, 20% uh, infected cells and so on. And once we have done that a couple of times and we gather um, enough data, we have basically a fixed um, algorithm that can be used uh, for day-to-day -day monitoring. So the device we use for that is the iLine F, which is a standalone um, microscope that comes with a single-use bioconnect, so a single-use sampling probe, and that probe is attached on a bioreactor, can be different types of bioreactors, and creates um, a loop of, of cells via a pump that are pumped to um, the microscope. So it's a closed loop system where there is no risk of contamination. Uh, and once the images are taken, the images are analyzed on the computer next to the microscope. And there is uh, a real time re result presented uh, on the display of the computer. So this is an example of a screenshot. So this is the, the most basic uh, setup where we are only looking at cell count and viability, where you see on the left side of the screen um, all the individual data points during a run. So we can, um, we can present you a data point or a result every 30 minutes, but that can be um, as well every hour, every two hours, every three hours, whatever is, is preferred. And, but every 30 minutes is basically the maximum. So every 30 minutes we come up with a result and, and with an, um, an analysis of the culture you're monitoring. In this case, the green dots indicate all the viable cells, the red uh, dot indicates the dead cells, and the yellow dots indicate aggregates. And when the aggregates are small enough, um, you even get a count on the amount of cells within the aggregates. And then, of course, on the left side of the screen, um, you see the results on the viable cell density and um, total cell density viability, but also an, a distribution graph, in this case, of the diameter. So we, you can analyze all the individual parameters, even on a single cell level. 
um, you can export all the data uh, that can be as small as as a as a PDF report where at the end of the run or that can be as big as a CSV file which contains all the information of all the parameters on all um, all the data points for all the cells so of course there is a big statistical relevance um, as we take around 1200 images per day and analyze around 1200 images per day which is a huge different difference with uh, standard cell counters and uh, monitoring devices on top of that we do not require any dilution up to certain cell densities um, which helps to eliminate the dilution bias and um, observer bias here you see as well that the result that we generate so automatically the the graphs on viability and viable cell density are generated as well all this is done in software that's opc ready and this software that can be connected to other um, devices or controllers to create feedback loops or to automatically upload and update um, databases where you follow up uh, all your cultures and that helps of course to automate all the processes the benefits of automation some of them are listed on the slide but are usually very well known uh, i would say the one of the most important ones is the increased control and the time gain and traceability of uh, of the results um, every device will generate the same results on uh, the same bioreactor run if everything is the same so that was in a nutshell what what we do um, the the background of our technology i will now now move forward to a case study so the viral infection kinetics monitoring uh, something we did together with uh, a couple of partners so if we look at the viral infection kinetics and and how it's monitored today everybody will agree that it's very important to monitor the viral kinetics in order to be able to understand um, the infection process a little bit better and to be sure that um, you can maximize the yields and, and really fully harness the infection process. This is, however, very time consuming. Uh, you need to do sampling. The sample needs to be prepared, prepared before the analysis. The analysis has to be performed, of course. Uh, a lot of the times that's via using a very strict protocol and live assay like the TCID 50, um, which takes on top of that a lot of time before you really get a result. Um, and I would say if you get results 24 hours later, then you might have just missed the maximum yield peak of, uh, of, of your culture. So the current challenges include definitely the need for a sample free and protocol free method. Uh, the need for a quick analysis, so the infected cell population quantification. Now it's usually performed via flow cytometry, but that's also not the quickest. Um, and there is also the need for a direct method. So there are a couple of indirect methods already available, but none of them, uh, there are no methods available for real, um, in real time monitoring of the infection kinetics. So the experimental setup in this case was um, the use of insect cells, SF9, together with uh, baclovirus. So we were looking at the baclovirus expression system in a fat batch um, mode with seven days duration of the typical run. Three experiments, the first two infection happened after 72 hours, the third one after 80 hours, and the question was, can the holographic fingerprint be used to determine the viral uh, kinetics during the infection process. We compared, of course, the device on the regular um, parameters like viable cell density, diameter, and viability uh, with the standard methods of, um, of the partners. And everything, I would say, was very comparable for all three of the parameters. Um, so in this case, it was compared with the, vi with the Vicel uh, in the last two experiments, we added the NovaFlex as well. So we showed the same trend lines, we showed the same 
um, more or less the same results for all three experiments. But then we started creating um, the training set to define the non-infected and infected cells and to look if we could see differences. So cell images, the beginning of the run that were used to create virus-free uh, training set. Cell images of the end of the run were used to create the infected cell training set. So the fingerprint really for the SF9 infected cells. And then there was an extra filter used to get an optimal training set. Now you can already clearly see on the 3D holographic image that there is um, a difference between a non-infected cell and an infected cell. Uh, and this cannot be detected by any other uh, method except the holographic uh, imaging method that we are using. This allowed us to subtract a very specific fingerprint um, and a very specific difference between a non-infected and an infected cell. So here you can see the images of the experiment start and the experiment end, uh, both in the uh, phase contrast and holographic mode. And of, of those parameters, there are 10 parameters that really stood out on um, and that were really affected by the viral infection kinetics. So cell area was something that everybody was expecting to, to change, as that is uh, something that sometimes is already used. Um, but more than that, the other nine parameters basically um, describe the difference that you can see in the, um, in the 3D holographic image between a non-infected and an infected cell. And if we look at the graph that, that we, of course, um, generated, then you can clearly see that the um, detected percentage of infected cells goes up with the expected infection rate and that there is as well a difference between the first two runs and the third run where the infection happened to be uh, later. So here you can see how the software looks like uh, using the um, mode where you can monitor the infected cells. So on top of the viable cell density and the um, viability, you get as well a number on the percentage of infected cells and you get automatically the graph that indicates how the infection is moving forward. We can still generate results on a, on a single cell level and you can still have a look at single cell level uh, if um, that's interested. Everything can still be ex exported. But in the end, the conclusion was that the experimental goal was met. So the iLine F technology can be used to monitor viral kinetics in real time during um, bioreactor run. So there is the online real-time monitoring of viable cell density, total cell density, viability, and cell uh, diameter, which are produced consistent and with uh, reproducible results. So there was, of course, an optimization done of the infection process monitoring at the customer side. But we can do this basically for any virus produced in SF9 cells and even um, in other cell types. The BioConnect, so the single-use uh, disposable sampling probes, reduce heavily the risk of contamination during the run, which is most of the time consistent with the client manufacturing quality procedures. And we are using a non-invasive and this label or dye-free system that never comes in contact or never consumes uh, any of the cultures and any of the cells. Um, we as well upgraded our um, BioConnect. So in, in the small movie I, I played earlier, you could see that um, the BioConnect was installed on a regular glass third bioreactor. We can actually, as of, as of now, connect our BioConnect and connect our sampling probe to any type of bioreactors. We, we can use Luberlox, we can use C-Flex um, weldable tubing. So that means that there is no limitation on, on the type of bioreactor that you're using in, uh, in your process. Um, and that everybody can, can benefit from, from the algorithm that we have in our hands to uh, monitor uh, viral infection kinetics. We have a couple of other applications. So of course you can use the device as well for um, CHO cells monitoring. 
but as well for immunotherapy cell monitoring, so dendritic cells and CAR T cells. Uh, we have some first experience with hex cells and other uh, cell types that are used in the market. Um, but if you have a very specific question, I would say feel free to ask. We should have some time left after uh, the presentation for questions. So thank you very much. Um, I love to continue the discussion now for a couple of minutes, but as well during the bioprocessing summit in Boston in August, um, so next month, or you can always contact me um, or via the website or um, via my email address. Okay, thank you very much, Jan. We actually got a question. Um, the question is, hi, can you count clusters larger than 150 micrometers or cells clustered on microspheres? Um, the, the quick answer is no. Um, basically, big clusters will clog the sampling probe and will clog the system. Uh, and at the same time, it will be very difficult to have a very clear, nice image of the cells within the cluster. Uh, so that, that will be very, very difficult. And, and therefore we say, no, it's not possible. Okay, good, thank you. Um, maybe, what, what is the current status actually on the, the what is the, the biggest cell that you can measure? Maybe that's a good one to give to everyone. Um, we, we can measure all mammalian cell types or human cell types uh, and even smaller uh, towards insect cells and, and yeast is also possible. So everything within that range is definitely possible. Um, if cluster formation happens, then I would say uh, clusters up to a maximum of 10, which are more or less monolayer and not a 3D, um, do not form a 3D formation, um, shouldn't be a problem as well. But anything bigger than that or anything smaller, like uh, bacteria uh, cells, um, are out of our um, limits. Okay, good. In the meanwhile, we got another question. Uh, is it suitable for microcarrier culture system? Uh, example, ferro cell line. No, for the same reason. Um, it, it's very difficult to get a clear image on on those uh, cells that are surfaced on the um, microcarriers. And if it gets a little bit too big, it will clog the system. Okay, then another question. Can you elaborate on the application of uh, on CAR T cells? Yes. Um, so we have another upcoming webinar that will be more specific on CAR T, but in a nutshell, um, we used the same machine learning process to generate very specific algorithms for uh, the CAR-T industry. So we have, we have already a couple of algorithms that are ready to use when it comes to monitoring um, viability, viable cell density, cell count, um, and we are working on some more specific phenotyping algorithms as well. Uh, but those are still under development. And of course, when it comes to the BioConnect, that can be connected to a, to a rocking motion back or to a wave back um, with, with the new connection adapter to have. Okay, very good. Um, I had actually a personally a question as well. Um, wh why is actually the 30 minute uh, max limit of the system? Yeah. Um, that, that is because we take 25 images before we um, give a result. So we average out the, um, the results of 25 images and, and then we come up with the data point. And it takes roughly one minute um, to have a clear image. And then we use the other five images, uh, the other five minutes to um, really clearly flush the sampling probe, just to be sure that we are not taking images of the same cells over and over again, and as well to be sure that, that nothing starts, uh, starts clogging in the sampling probe. So it's a combination of um, the fluidic setup and um, the statistical relevance that is given by the 25 images. 
I see. Thank you. Uh, there's another question. If possible, the system uh, can do this. Uh, the, the do the system a manual sampling, uh, or is it only auto sampling? Um, it's only auto sampling. So if if you want to do, if you want to have let's say a comparable method, but offline, we have another device for that. It's called the QMod. Uh, it's basically a 3D holographic camera that can be connected to a regular microscope um, and that uses very similar software and very similar algorithms to, to take a couple of images and analyze a very small amount of, uh, of cells or of sample. Uh, and then you have a manual, um, a manual device, but the iLine F as, as it is, is really an automated inline monitoring device. Sorry, I worked my mic off. I'm sorry. Uh, there was another question. Uh, can you explain on infection monitoring? Could it be used for monitoring uh, transfected cells? Is the morphology of the transfected cells comparable to the infected cells? Um, yes, because it it's not because the morphology doesn't really change when. Um, an infection occurs that nothing will happen with the 3D holographic fingerprint. Uh, so that's why we are not only looking at the, um, at the morphology or morphological parameters, but also at the three other subcategories um, with, within the cells. So the, the optical um, parameters, the, the face texture, intent, the face texture and, um, sorry, the um, intensity texture parameters. So if if you remember with the top 10 parameters of the SF9 Bacillus virus uh, infection, there was actually only one that was, a, or two that was, a, that are a true morphological parameter. So the cell area and the cell diameter um, and the other eight are more or less um, optical parameters. And we foresee that to happen to cells that do not change a lot in morphology uh, once infected. Okay, good. Um, then there's the another question. What's the maximum cell density Officio can measure? It, it depends on, uh, on cell type, of course. Um, we have experience with CHO um, cell cultures that go up to 35 million cells per ml. Uh, and that is about the maximum, I would say. Um, with SF9 cells, which are a little bit smaller, we suspect that we can go higher. With yeast, which is as well smaller, we can go uh, much higher. Um, but that are the cell, the maximum cell densities we, we still feel comfortable with. Um, that means we are ready to go when it comes to uh, batch and fat batch uh, methods when it comes to perfusion, uh, at the moment we don't have a solution for that yet. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you already have installed base slash references? Yes. Um, so there are a couple of universities uh, and a couple of companies as well. Um, one of them is Novavax, and Novavax will present actually their results at the bioprocessing summit. Okay, and then is it possible to set the time points for the sampling? If yes, what about the limitations of the times? Um, I'm I'm not quite following that question. So I, what I think uh, the uh, asker is mean uh, means is uh, the uh, we were talking about the half hour. Uh, I said bit of the five minutes and the twenty the, the five minutes. Uh, flushing and the 25 minutes taking sample, if you can change those times? Uh, yes, um, so you can you can both um, increase the amount of images that you take as well as um, the time 
we produce a data point. Um, so basically, every 30 minutes is, is the maximum, but you can easily go to every uh, every hour or every two hours or every three hours uh, or even once a day. Um, we do advise to keep a minimum of 25 images per data point. Okay, very good. Um, then I don't see at the moment any more questions. Um, if anyone has, please fill them in, or uh, if not, or if anything, of course, comes up, you can always contact me or Jan directly, and we can answer your questions then. Okay. Seems not like there are any other questions. Um, so I will close the webinar now. Thank you all for joining again. Thank you very much, Jan, for uh, hosting this uh, to be our guest speaker today. And um, I don't know if you have any final remarks. No, thank you very much uh, for inviting us for this webinar. Uh, thank you for the questions, and I hope to see you all and hear you all soon. Okay, thank you very much, Jan. Have a nice day, everyone.